plans. But it all fits under a pretty simple philosophy. And many of you are wearing stickers or plaques that say it, and the philosophy is we're stronger together. We are strong, but we're stronger together. E pluribus unum, out of many one, we are stronger together. And we see that. I, I've seen it through my entire career. As a civil rights lawyer in Virginia, we're stronger together. Not when we're divided against each other. No, that makes us weaker. And in public office, whether I was the mayor of a very diverse city of Richmond or a very diverse state, Virginia, oh, wow, got some Richmond, got some Virginia here I like. Um, or now working in the U.S. Senate where you're having to look at issues all over the country. Just like you look at issues all over Ohio and all over the country, we're stronger together. When we work together, we can solve any problem we have. When we divide up against one another, the easy things don't get done, right? The easy things don't get done. There are three pillars of our campaign. We're going to be stronger together and build an economy that works for everybody and not just a few. Everybody has to see that there is a ladder that they can climb to have the life success that they want. And Hillary and I believe that, that we're stronger together in building that economy. And the economy shouldn't be like a winner-take-all, top dog gets it and everybody else gets pushed to the side. And there's a, a sharp contrast there. We think we're stronger together and safer together if we not only have a strong military, you guys are a strong military community because of the base here, because of Wright Patterson. Very, very important to Dayton. Very, very important to Ohio. Very, very important to our country. And we have the same thing in Virginia. We have a lot of military installations. I'm one of two U.S. Senators with the child in the military, as I mentioned earlier. We're going to be stronger together, and our military will be better if we make the investments in them and respect them, but also we have to have strong alliances. Hillary understands that. She's been an armed services member. She's been a secretary of state. Strong military, strong alliances. That makes you stronger. You don't become stronger by dissing the military, by calling the military a disaster, by saying the general's a disaster, by trashing John McCain because he was a POW. You don't become stronger by attacking a Virginia family, the Khan family, Gold Star family, who lost a child in the military. And you don't... And you don't, and you don't become stronger by dissing our allies and proposing to tear up the very alliances that we should be strengthening if we want to be strong. So again, stronger together, we are stronger as a nation together. Building walls and tearing up alliances is no way to make us strong, it's a way to make us weak. And then finally, we're stronger together if we just have respect for each other. I mean, look, look at who we are, right? This is a very beautiful and diverse crowd, and that is the beauty of our country. And so many other countries wish they could be more like us. Not that we're perfect, not that we don't have more work to do, but they wish that we would be more like us. I think that uh, that sets out the contrast pretty well with Donald Trump. Again, on the economy, we want it to work for everybody. He is more interested when he was doing business, he was willing to step all over people. And when he's promoting an economy, it's kind of a winner take all and everybody else gets pushed aside. There's a sharp contrast there on our national security. Strong contrast between the experienced and sound judgment of Hillary Clinton and the kind of emotionally volatile and self-absorbed and un uh, inexperienced and unprepared Donald Trump. And then on this respect issue, I mean, you know this. This has probably been the thing in the campaign that's been the sharpest. You cannot, I don't think, you, you should not be president of the United States if you, if you go after people because they have a Mexican-American heritage, or go after people because they're Muslims, or suggest, uh, say, offensive things about women. You know, th this is just not, this is, we're living in 2016, not 1816, right? We ought to be promoting, promoting a coming together and a, and a working together. Hillary and I have a lot of plans. I'm going to spend the rest of my time today talking about one really important thing, which is education and the affordability of college. But we've got, we've got a lot of plans on things. We think we owe you a, the respect of if we're running, we should tell you what we want to do and we should tell you how we're going to pay for it and what it will mean. And so we put out, just within the last week, Stronger Together, no surprise with the title, right? And you can get this, you can get it online, you can order it on Amazon and it'll tell you everything we want to do. Now, Donald Trump put out a book too and I just want to show it to you because I think it demonstrates something that's very different, very different about the two campaigns. Okay, so this is us, Stronger Together. This is Donald Trump, Crippled America. 
I mean, can you, but this is the, this is the book that Donald Trump wrote when he decided I want to run for president. I want to tell you what I see. Hillary and I see stronger together, right? Stronger together. <laughs> Donald Trump crippled America. Look at that look. It's like he just swallowed 10 lemons. I mean, and I, I, I do know, I mean, I think I know something about leadership, Governor Strickland, and I do. You can't sugarcoat problems. You got to acknowledge them. But I think Americans are upbeat, patriotic, can do, optimistic people. I don't, I don't know any leader that says crippled America is the vision. No. We are upbeat, positive, and optimistic people. And that's a real difference between Hillary Clinton and me. But there is an issue that I do really want to talk about today, and, and this is why we've come to Stivers, because students here and their parents and school officials, I think, and the broader community, I think we understand that one of the keys to having that strong economy is having an education system that, that really works well. And, and it's got to work from pre-K education, early childhood education, through celebrating great teachers in K-12, through college, through career and technical. In fact, raise your hand if you're an educator in, the, in, the, in this room. Raise your hand. Give every educator a round of applause, right? Yep. Thank you, guys. This is very important personally to Hillary and me. Um, when Hillary graduated from Yale Law School, she could have gone to Wall Street. Instead, she went to work with the Children's Defense Fund to focus on education inequities. When I, was, when I was in the middle of law school, I took a year off to go run a Jesuit technical school in Honduras, teaching kids to be welders and carpenters. I'm a huge fan of the trades and career and technical training. My, my wife, Ann, who was full-time on the campaign trail, was Secretary of Education in Virginia, stepped down to run, work full-time for Hillary Clinton. So, these education issues are deeply personal to us, and one of the ones that is the most challenging right now is the cost of college. So I'm seeing some high school students right here, and uh, Rosalia talked a little bit about it. I mean, if you are in high school, or if you're the parent or guardian or grandparent of a high schooler, this is something that's causing some significant concerns. I was the oldest of three when I decided to go to high school. At that, at that point in my family's life, it wasn't a simple proposition to figure out how to afford it. Um, but that was 1976. It was a lot easier then than it is now because the costs of college, the percentage of a family's income that has to go into paying for college has really gone up. Beginning in about the mid-1980s, it really started to take off. And so, um, and I know this, I've, I'm, I'm one semester away of finishing paying for college for my three kids. So I'm a really happy guy. I'm a really happy guy. But I see how much has changed since I was there. I see how much has changed. And Hillary and I and my wife, Ann, we know kind of what you're grappling with and we want to help. And that's why we've made a very ambitious pledge as part of Stronger Together. And that is basically with respect to higher education, and Hillary worked on this significantly with Bernie Sanders. And the idea is this, is we want to make college in America debt-free for everybody. Debt-free. Debt-free. Now, I'm going to... That is... do it because they understand that if the young generation and and then we, we also for Syria itself and the Syrian people, okay? Go on the HillaryClinton.com website, pull up College Calculator, and you'll have a chance to see how this could affect you. Now look, there, I, and I was a co-sponsor of a similar bill in the Senate 
um, that we're pushing, but before it's even gotten through in the Senate, we're giving that tool and making that tool available to all of you. Um, now, on higher ed, Donald Trump has a little bit of a different idea, and, and I want to just say, talk a little bit about that, and then I'm going to get to my close, which is how to participate, make, how we, how's the race looking, let's make sure we do what we do to win. Um, Donald Trump's view on, he hadn't put out a plan on higher education, hasn't put out a plan. But, but we know something about Donald Trump and higher education because of Trump University. So that, that's, that's what we know. That's what we know about Donald Trump and education. He, he viewed education as, hey, I think I can get an awful lot of people to give me an awful lot of money by selling Trump U. And in the lawsuit that's being filed right now, a lot of documents are coming out about the way they encouraged the marketers to get as much money from students as they could if students had questions like, I'm not sure I can afford it. Oh, just max out your credit card. You just put it on your credit card. You can pay for it later. But the lawsuits now that are being filed against Trump University have just some heartbreaking stories, stories of veterans who got veterans' benefits and then in a tough economy were trying to find a path forward and gave a lot of money to Trump and didn't get anything. Essentially, it wasn't worth the paper it was written on. Um, widows who got veterans' benefit, the, the people whose husbands had been killed in action were able to use the GI Bill to go to school themselves but did it in a way and then found out it was a it was a ripoff. When Donald Trump is now in, in court over this, um, and there is a judge presiding over the case, an Indiana-born judge, because he's Mexican-American, Donald Trump is going around saying that there's an inherent conflict of interest and you can't trust a federal judge to fairly resolve this case against him. And while the university is kind of in a really weird position now because of the lawsuit, Trump has said, well, I can't wait till the lawsuit's over so I can open it up again. There's a pattern here, and the pattern is people who needed something trusted Donald Trump, and their money got taken, and they realized that they shouldn't have trusted him. Uh, contractors who worked with Donald Trump on his casinos and golf courses, they did the work. They paid their workers. They paid the material costs. And when it came time to get paid, Trump said, look, I'm not paying you. Sue me if you want. He knew that the small businesses, that, like the ones my dad, the one my dad ran, and the one Hillary's dad ran, they wouldn't be able to bring a lawsuit against Donald Trump, so they accepted 10 or 20 cents on the dollar. There is a pattern. But the last thing we should do with education, which is the path to success across this country when we do it right, the last thing we should do with education is let the, you know, America's chief education officer be a guy who has seen education as a way he can make some money and rip some people off and them. And now we're finding out that the Trump to give campaign contributions to attorney generals who won't sue Trump University and to fund lawsuits against attorney generals like the New York attorney general who are going after Trump University. This guy's got a very different view of education than most people I know, certainly Hillary and me and my wife but I think it's a very different view than you have here in Ohio that you have here at Stivers, and that's what's at stake. But we got to win. We have to win. Let me just give you a status report and then tell you how you can help. Um, status report is this. I feel good about where we are, but I take nothing for granted. When we went into the first convention, the Cleveland convention, um, the race was basically tied. When we came out of the Philadelphia Convention, our ticket had a good lead. It had a good lead. That always happens. You get the bump out of the convention. It always happens. It usually settles back a bit. And over the last few weeks, it has settled back a bit. We still like where we are. Um, there are some states that were supposed to be razor thin where we've opened up a nice lead. But there's a lot of states, and Ohio is one of them. And Ohio and Florida are the two, like with the biggest electoral votes, where it's still very, very close. And so the reason I'm here today is I wanted to talk about the education differences between Hillary and Donald, but I really wanted to say, hey, guys, the future of this country is in your hands. Not to put any pressure on you. Not to put any pressure. The future of the country is right in your hands. And isn't that a good thing? Isn't that a good thing? You, um, you don't need to worry. You don't need to worry about other states. All you need to worry is about what's right in your hands, Ohio the ability to 
choose the next president, the ability to decide whether are we stronger America, stronger together America, or crippled America? That's a choice that you get to make. And, and, and you have a unique ability to do it as individuals um, by organizing and by volunteering. Um, just real quick, I know you probably watch TV and Governor Strickland sees this. You see the negative ads on TV, right? They just, they just you know, that, after Citizens United, it just opened up a floodgate and so now you see negative ads. Sometimes you don't even know who's running them, and that's what you see. But what's happening is citizens are kind of turning off to that. I mean, do any of you kind of find the onslaught of ads to be kind of a turnoff? And yet, and yet, while you get turned off to the ads, people are still interested. People still care. They just don't think the ads are giving them what they need. And so what they, what they are willing to, to trust is a word of a friend. So somebody in class with them, a coworker, a parishioner, a neighbor, somebody you talk to at the grocery store when you're there. The word of a friend still really matters to people. In a nation of 330 million people, folks are still looking for information. And a word of a friend about the campaign, about Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine, and why our policies are the right ones, and Donald Trump and Mike Pence, and why they're the wrong ones, people still take that very important. In fact, in a state where it's close, that's even more important. You're more likely to convince somebody in a state that's close. You're more likely to affect the outcome. And I'll tell you something else. Even if you're not a friend, if you call and say, I'm a volunteer for the Hillary Clinton campaign, they know nothing about you, but they do know this. If you took the time to volunteer when you didn't have to do it, it means that you think it's important. And for most people, that will open the door up to have a conversation and to talk about the race and issues that somebody cares about. And they may ask you a question, and you can answer it, or may, you may have to go get an answer and get it back to them. But I guess I'm just here to tell you, some people think our nation is so big that the grassroots stuff doesn't matter anymore. I'm here to tell you, it matters. And maybe because of people tuning out the ads, it might matter more today with 330 million people than it mattered, you know, hundreds of years ago when it was New England town meetings. The person-to-person -person stuff matters. And that's what you can do. In fact, we've watched you do it. You know, Virginia is a state that wasn't very competitive for a very long time. Now we are, big battleground state. We love that we fought our way onto the stage where we're relevant again. But for a long time, we weren't. And we would watch you guys. You know, we would watch y'all to see, is y'all, do you use that here? Is that okay? Okay. We, we'd watch y'all to see, you know, how you were doing it in Ohio, person-to-person -person politics labor deeply engaged, others deeply engaged, activists deeply engaged, and that's what it's going to take to win the election. Um, I asked earlier to raise your hand if you're part of the campaign, if you want to volunteer to make phone calls and talk to folks in the last few weeks, easy to do. All you have to do is take out your phone and text together. Just text that to 47246. And if you do that, you will get a reach out almost immediately and they'll ask you to come help out, calling people, talking to people, trying to persuade them. Every state has different rules. I think you know the rules here uh, in Ohio, the, the rules about registration. You can register to vote all the way up to October 11th. So a month from yesterday, last day to register. That's really important to get people registered. And early in-person voting in Ohio starts on the 12th and it runs all the way through Monday, November 7th. And that's really important too. So remember those dates, registration up to October 11, early vote from October 12th to November 7th. Here's the last thing I'm going to say. I'll let you in on, a, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I was a civil rights lawyer and a missionary, and I've been in elected office for 22 years. And in campaigns, I have run eight races, and I have won eight races. I'm undefeated. I'm undefeated. And um, can I just tell you, I'm not going to lose this one. I am not going to lose this one. Hillary and I, we are not going to lose this one. Now, now I've got to really be, be candid with you, though. I've won all my races, but I barely win my races. I mean, I, if, I, if I were to leave you with the impression that I'm a big landslide guy, I would have left you with the wrong impression. I barely win my races. And I'll tell you students, if you're thinking about careers, and if you find that you're barely likable enough, think about politics. All you got to do is 51%. I mean... It's, it's a good profession for the barely likable enough. You just got to get 51%. I, I, I barely win my races often because Virginia's tough.
Virginia was super red when I started running. It's better now, but I tend to win really close races because it's tough. But we don't mind tough, do we? I mean, come on, we don't, we don't mind tough. What I do to win races when they are tough is I put in my head, every race I run, same thing. I'm the underdog until they call me the winner. I am the underdog until they call me the winner. Now, I like that because, hey, I like underdogs. And I think a lot of us probably gravitate toward the Democratic side because we sort of like underdogs. You know, that, that's kind of the, we're kind of good Samaritan people. I mean, if I can use that lesson from my own church where somebody who's had trouble beating up side of the road, we're not the ones who are just passing by and acting like nothing happens. We are the ones who tend to pass by and then stop and say, hey, can we help out? We, we're kind of for the underdogs. Um, you know, if we weren't for the underdogs, we wouldn't have fought to get uninsured people health insurance, right? And we did fight, and they do have it because we fought for the underdogs. So it's not, it's not hard for us to put that thought in our mind, but that's the thought we're going to have to put in our mind because no matter what the polls say, think of ourselves as the underdogs. We are trying to do something that's never been done. There's never been a woman president of this country. And I bet people in this room, you've had the experience of trying to do something that people told you you couldn't do. Sometimes more than once or more than a dozen times. That's not going to work out for you. Sometimes the person who says it to you is kind of an enemy. Sometimes it might even be a friend. I don't want you to be hurt. I don't think you're going to be able to achieve that. Hillary has heard this her entire life. And she's up against it now. People saying it's not going to happen. So when you are trying to do something that's never been done, you've got to think that you're the underdog. And we are in a season of surprises. Pundits have been wrong. Polls have been wrong. And we are after Citizens United, where people can just dump anything they want on TV and say anything they want. And so you've got to assume, even though we're feeling pretty good right now about the polls, that this stuff about, you know, trying to make history and all, it, it's not easy and it wasn't supposed to be easy. But... But again, I know, I don't know you, but I know something about you. And again, it's that I've got a lot of underdog people out here. And i got a lot of people who don't mind doing things that are hard. And i got a lot of people who understand that if it's important, it's probably going to be hard. If it was easy, maybe it's not so important. The race is eight weeks from tomorrow. Everybody in this country has an enormous stake in this. Not just the voters, everybody. And people all over the world are watching us, and they want us to lead... And they know if we choose rightly, we'll lead right for people here. So I'll just close and say this. You know, if, if you can just show, it's not asking you to do something that is new to you. you. You've demonstrated to America and Ohio, you know how to do this. You know how to take care of business and get the job done and win a close election and advance progressive values. And if you will just do that between now and November 8th, we will make history as a nation by electing Hillary Clinton president, and then we'll start the real work of making history, battling for an economy that works for everybody, battling for the security of our nation, and battling to build that community of respect that every American deserves. Thanks for having me in Dayton. It's great to come out and be here at Stivers. Let's go win.